It's HBR One, All Things Considered, and I'm Dave Lawrence. Over the last year on All Things Considered, both NPR and HPR have done a number of reports and features about the poaching epidemic affecting the rhinoceros. Criminals supplying rhino horn to people in mainly two countries, Vietnam and China, for what is basically keratin found in human hair and finger or toenails that has caused the currently exploding rhino extinction crisis. And it's led to what is widely being called the tipping point, where more rhinos are being slaughtered than being born. It's also the name of one of two new reports about the crisis from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. The author of the reports published last month is Julian Rademeyer. He is also the author of the book Killing for Profit, Exposing the Illegal Rhino Horn Trade. We welcome him now. Aloha and mahalo, Julian. Thank you for being available. Hi, Dave. Thank you. It's a pleasure. For background on the urgency of the crisis. Over the last decade, more than 6,000 rhinos have been killed in Africa. The eye of the storm in many ways is South Africa's Kruger National Park. South Africa is home to 70% of the world's last remaining rhinos. The bulk of those are clustered in the Kruger National Park, which is the size of Israel or Wales. Last year was the worst year on record so far in Africa. 1,377 rhino killed, most of those in South Africa, but there were also dramatic spikes in poaching in Namibia and Zimbabwe, primarily black rhino, the most critically endangered of all rhino. And there are only about 5,000 black rhino left in the world today, around 20, 21,000 white rhino. It was estimated last year that around 7,500 poachers entered the park. To put that in context, you have a ranger force of just over 400, 430 rangers on the ground. So it's an extraordinary assault on wildlife. And I think in many ways, we've hit the point now where those populations are beginning to dip and we've effectively run out of time. If something is going to change, it needs to change dramatically. I can't stress the urgency of that enough. What do you think would be the cause for such a dramatic increase in such a short period of time? I think the key driver was the emergence of new markets in Vietnam, one of the rising economic dragons of Southeast Asia. What's particularly disturbing in the last two or three years is clear evidence of increased involvement by Chinese nationals. We see more and more Chinese couriers, middlemen, people linked to Chinese organized crime networks being arrested or being implicated in the trade, along with large numbers of Vietnamese nationals. One of the key problems that we have in trying to tackle the rhino poaching crisis is that all too often it's been left in the hands of conservationists or environmental departments in government. What you're effectively dealing with here is very, very ruthless organized crime. That is a police competency. Environmental officials and conservation have neither the mandate or the powers or necessarily the manpower or the experience to tackle. In many ways, those have been the agencies and departments that have been drafting law enforcement agreements, both regionally and internationally, with very little success. I think there's a shifting trend. The United States, for instance, has taken a very hard line on wildlife trafficking. And that seems to be changing globally. That is what is required in some ways. You need to have the people with the necessary power to try and disrupt these networks across the length of the illicit supply chain. Another key area that's been identified by many people we spoke to, both in the region and internationally on the law enforcement front, is what's become known as the silo effect. Law enforcement agencies or private security companies not sharing information, not able to track and identify new and shifting threats. Corruption is rife in many of the countries along the rhino horn smuggling routes. South Africa is no exception to that. And we've seen our crime intelligence agency, which should be taking the lead in gathering intelligence on poaching networks and transnational syndicates, exposed to high levels of corruption. Numbers of officers there have been arrested, some of them linked to the rhino horn trade. Some of the things include very easy bail. Someone can commit these crimes against the rhinos, they get bail rather quickly, and then they disappear, especially if they're Chinese or Vietnamese. That is certainly the case in some countries. In Mozambique, there have been issues with legislation which penalizes poaching but doesn't penalize trafficking in wildlife products. So you'll have poachers who face 
jail time, but high-level traffickers paying a fine and being let off the hook. And if you look at convictions and you do an analysis of convictions that have been carried out, particularly in the South African context, the reality is that the conviction rates are very, very low because many of those cases never make it to court, kicked back to the police for further investigation. And unfortunately, the bulk of the effort seem to be focused primarily on the lower level of poaching syndicates. For all intents and purposes, these people are the cannon fodder for the syndicates. So unless you can disrupt the transnational networks whose tentacles span the globe, you're on a hiding to nowhere. The bulk of Vietnamese nationals who've been arrested and Chinese nationals have been on the lower end again. We're certainly not making inroads into the higher echelons of the criminal networks that are involved. And in fact, if you said to someone, name me a well-known drug dealing kingpin. Everyone would think of El Chapo or Pablo Escobar. Ask someone to name a key wildlife trafficking kingpin, I could count them on three fingers. We simply, in many cases, don't know who the kingpins are driving these particular crimes. What kind of sentences do these guys get? They vary quite broadly. A fairly key figure in a Thai liaison syndicate was sentenced to 40 years in prison. That sentence, however, was reduced on appeal to 12 years. But there have been sentences ranging from 15 to 20 years the couriers themselves are often recruited from poor communities in Vietnam and China, and they're expendable. And these networks, a major theme in definitely uh, the second report, Beyond Borders, is that Asian diplomats and government officials have been involved in the smuggling of rhino horn. One of the more recent incidents that occurred was in May last year when a North Korean diplomat and a Taekwondo master were arrested in Maputo, the capital of Mozambique, with four and a half kilograms of rhino horn and around 100,000 US dollars in cash in the diplomatic vehicle that they were using. And within 24 hours, the North Korean ambassador had flown out from South Africa to Mozambique, and they were quickly released. The vehicle was returned to them, and they drove across the border back into South Africa. And it took several months before South African authorities in the Department of International Relations and Cooperation took any action and eventually did ask the diplomat to leave the country. The Taekwondo master also returned to Pyongyang, and he's never returned. It seems that this was not an isolated incident involving these two, and the North Korean embassy is certainly playing a role in trafficking rhino horn. And you need to also look at the seniority of the diplomat who was arrested. He was the second most senior diplomat in that embassy. The Vietnamese embassy in South Africa has also been implicated on a number of occasions in smuggling rhino horn. The secretary at the embassy was filmed in the street right outside receiving rhino horns from a dealer. Vietnamese diplomatic vehicles have been used to move rhino horn. They're using their diplomatic immunity. They're using the diplomatic bag, which is essentially a blanket term that can refer to anything from an actual bag to a shipping container, to move quantities of rhino horn. Police who try and investigate these cases are told to back off. What we did with the report is we documented roughly about 26 cases involving diplomats, and in every single one of those cases, there were no prosecutions. Eventually, they were all let go. Protecting the rhinos that are there in Kruger, what would be some of the things you would think are needed immediately? The manpower, the number of people on the ground is really tiny. That total number, it works out to roughly one ranger for every 50 square kilometers. But that would only be the case if they worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So probably half that number being available at any given time. And if you talk to people in that national park or in other national parks, they will say again and again, nothing beats a well-motivated, well-trained, well-equipped ranger on the ground. You can throw as much technology at the problem as you can. Drones have been overhyped in my view in recent years. I think there's a role to play as a tool, but nothing beats boots on the ground, people who can track, people who know the lie of the land. I do think there is a desperate need for more manpower. We've tried a deployment of the military in the National Park, which has, for all intents and purposes, been fairly disastrous. The soldiers are poorly disciplined, are not trained for that environment. They don't want to be in that environment. And then the other problem that you have is that your average ranger didn't sign up to be a soldier in a war. One of the things that has worked in the past, and there are efforts to do that again now, is to try and break up your rhino population. Certainly in the 1960s, when the white rhino was on the brink of extinction in South Africa, those populations were broken up. Animals moved to the Kruger National Park, moved to zoos, 
and animals move to other countries. And that, in many ways, has been credited with saving the white rhino from extinction then. The basic idea being don't keep all your eggs in one basket. A thousand rhinos in Texas or a thousand rhinos in Hawaii, a thousand more somewhere else in the U.S., a few Australian locations. I've got to believe the poaching is going to be non-existent. Exactly. I've been to a conservation area in Florida, for instance. White oak. Which, uh, yes, white oak, which has a number of rhinos there. It's quite an odd experience seeing rhinos wandering around in a forest away from the African bush. But that project seems to be very successful. There seems to be very little, if any, danger to them. But beyond that, I think so much more needs to be done in terms of international cooperation on a law enforcement level in improving intelligence gathering, trying to effectively disrupt the networks along the length of the supply chain. What do you think the U.S. could do to contribute to this? Well, I think the U.S. is certainly playing a role. You've had quite a lot from, particularly from the Obama administration, trying to change the way that wildlife crime is approached and trying to approach it as transnational organized crime the U.S. Fish and Wildlife have done some remarkable investigations into the illicit trade from the U.S. side as part of Operation Crash, and there have been a number of high-profile arrests and convictions. There are a number of nonprofits, various organizations, who are doing really remarkable work. I've constantly been impressed by the very real passion. They do need support. U.S. dollars are a very key part of that support. And then globally, the U.S. through various agencies, USAID and others, has increasingly been playing a role in trying to assist nonprofit organizations and others who are involved in conservation and anti-poaching. And I think the U.S.'s reach is something that certainly could be of great help. But that said, I do think that without countries like China and Vietnam on board, you have very little chance of success. To have real impact on the transnational networks and the kingpins, you have to have China and Vietnam on side, and particularly China at this point. I think purely from a political point of view, there will be a reluctance from many African countries, many of whom have aligned themselves with China. We've hit a point where we are running out of time. Effectively, we, we have run out of time. That said, I don't think we can give up hope. There certainly are sizable rhino populations, but we're nearing the point of no return in some cases. There have been estimates done that if poaching continues at its current rate, the population within the Kruger National Park will be halved by 2008. 18. So again, it comes back to the degree of urgency that's required here. If you are going to work on community beneficiation projects, if you are going to tackle it from a law enforcement perspective, there's so much more that needs to be done, and certainly so much more that needs to be done rapidly. Any final thoughts that you think are important to share? I tend to look at rhino poaching and also elephant poaching as something that in a way represents the challenges we'll be facing with so many other environmental issues. The question we need to ask ourselves if we can't save the big iconic species, if we can't save rhinos, if we can't save elephants, what can we actually save? The threat to wildlife in general and various other environmental threats is so great. You've got an onslaught on pangolins, for instance. There's the reptile trade, the trade in lion bones, the trade in macaques and chimpanzees. There's a degree of looting and pillaging that's going on that we have not really seen before. And in some ways, this is the big test. It's a really good point. One look at one of those little creatures' faces, or even a big rhino, it's gut-wrenching. It's horrific. I kind of spent a lot of time on the ground. You don't really hit a point where you inured to it. As you said earlier, and as the, the cries of a wounded rhino is something quite extraordinary. It's a sound you, you never forget, because it's not something you really expect from an animal of that size. You go to the orphanages, it's a constant reminder of the sheer brutality of this. Author of the book, Killing for Profit, Exposing the Illegal Rhino Horn Trade, Julian Rademeyer, his reports can be found online, globalinitiative.net. Our full interview can be found online at hawaiipublicradio.org. Real service to these animals that you've provided by doing this, and I even understand you quit a job so that you could just cover this in the way that you have. Yeah. It's remarkable. I really appreciate what you've done with these reports and in giving us your time on Hawaii Public Radio. Thank you so much, Dave. No, it's been a great pleasure.